My name is Mo Manklang. Um, I am the communications director of the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives. I'm super happy to be here, um, all the way from Philadelphia. Uh, yes, love for Philadelphia. I will always take that. Um, so I want to I want to I want to thank all of you um, not just for being here but for being here at Common Bound. Um, you know I've been sitting in all these sessions uh, for the past few days, and and really I've just been in awe of that uh, everyone is bringing their full selves. Have you found that? Have you been seeing? You know people are coming um, not just not just coming to attend but coming with questions and with challenges, and I've been feeling sharpened as I've been here. Um, so I, I just feel like I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I'm getting deeper, getting sharper in, in how I'm thinking about the work that, that we're doing. Um, and, and I want to thank the New Economy Coalition. Give it up for the team. <laughs> Woo. Um, I have, I have been, I've been personally astounded by this team that looks so chill, like more chill than I am on a, like a summer day on the beach. <laughs> All these people are running this humongous, amazing conference and just like hanging out and talking to people, which is wonderful. Um, I, I got to know Common Bound um, in 2014. Um, I was watching it from home from the live stream. Um, and I remember watching um, like Adrian Marie Brown and, and Gar from the Democracy Collaborative and Gopal from um, the Movement Generation and watching Climbing Poetry do this like really slim and like poetry performance. And I thought like, who are these people that I have never seen before? I don't know anything about them. Uh, and, and I was just, I was so in awe of the wisdom that I was hearing. Um, that I was like, I need to find out more about this. Uh, and I was telling, um, I think Eli, who's back there, give it up for Eli, who's been wonderfully coordinating all this, um, that uh, I, a friend of mine gave me the program, you know, that like thick, beautiful program that has all the information about this conference in it. Um, I got the one from 2014 and I, I read every single thing in it and I was like, I need to know everything about all these people and that's been my mission since then. And um, now I'm here and it feels really wonderful. Um, I feel really thankful to be here with all of you. Uh, and, um, and yeah, uh, so, uh, and, and at the same time, I'm like, why are you asking me to host this thing? <laughs> I, I'm so, I, I'm just, uh, you know, um, I, I, I live in awe of, of the worker cooperatives that I talk to every day. Um, you know, they're the, the people that are doing the real work and I have the blessing of being able to share their stories. Um, I think that people generally ask me to do these things because they do improv. Um, has anybody ever seen improv comedy? Yeah, I love improv comedy. I love making people get silly and roar and things like that. Um, and I love improv comedy because uh, it's only, people always ask me like to tell them jokes, which is like just not the thing that improv comedy does. Um, because the best improv is only good if it's true. And um, if it explores the ideas that bring us together um, and or you know, in a, in a, you're watching an improv show and it asks the questions that like force you to view the world from a different lens, um, and that is what we're doing here right now. Uh, we're going to hear from five amazing speakers who are going to um, have us uh, give us a peek into their world um, and ask us questions about big ideas and big questions um, that'll help help to challenge us and move us forward. Um, so, uh, I am going to mostly be out of the way for the rest of the time, I, I, um, and I, I'm going to quickly introduce people um, and get them up on the stage so that you can hear, um, hear from them. Um, but what I ask is that you um, keep that roar in your hearts um, and talk back. Give some love to these speakers. So if you hear something that you like, give it a snap, give it a shout. Uh, like. Throw your hands up in the air. Um, I, I, it's, uh, it's really hot up on this stage <laughs> and kind of scary to be in front of like a, an auditorium full of people. So I, I encourage you to talk back to the speakers as they are talking, uh, but don't talk the whole time because you know, that's not cool. Um, so, um, and, and one last thing that I'll say is, you know, I love that these talks explore different pieces of the puzzle 
they're, they're all very different. Um, and uh, I was thinking earlier today that it's like kind of like, you know, that story about the elephant, you know, like one guy's touching the tail and he feels one, he f feels like it feels like it's a snake and one guy is feeling the leg and he feels like it's like a column and they're all um, seeing different pieces of the elephant. But the really awesome thing about Common Bound is that we can see the whole elephant at the same time and we're looking at it together. And even though we're all in different parts of the elephant, like, we're all here, we're able to look at it all together and see how it fits together. So, so with that, um, we are going to have our first speaker come up. Um, it's Beatrice Allais from Chantier de l'Economie Sociale. Um, she's gonna be talking about the social solidarity economy in Quebec, Canada. Um, Chantier brings together actors and partners in the social economy in Quebec um, in order to promote collective entrepreneurship uh, and develop sectors and tools that are able to um, support the development um, of solidarity, equity, and accountability um, in Quebec. So uh, I'm a big fan of the slow clap. So, oh, that's not my pocket. Okay, cool. So I'm going to do this. So. You're with me, right? Okay, so we're gonna slow clap and bring Beatrice on the stage, okay? So. Yay, Beatrice! Hi. It's nice to be here. Um, so, I wanted to talk about the what we call the social economy in Quebec. I just wanted to make maybe two parentheses before starting. Uh, the first one, I think because I was following what's been going on in the US, but also in, in other places, and, and I think it's important to talk about the economy, but when basic human rights are being violated, when we, people don't have the access to you know, life, liberty, human dignity, uh, obviously the priority is not your economic model, it's being sure that you're safe and your families are safe. So. It can be maybe spurious to some people to be talking about this, even though I think an unbalanced economy contributes to the root problem that people get take away, take their rights taken away. Um, and the other point I wanted to make was sometimes uh, the Quebec experience is perceived as like, well, that's nice. You guys are some utopia out there. Um, I don't think Quebec is a utopia in any way. I think we have a lot of things that we need to improve or build. But I also think it's not up to me to tell anyone else what they should do. I can speak of my experience and you'll see from that what's applicable, what's completely irrelevant, what's really ambitious and what's really naive. That's, that's up to you. So I think we all need to walk a line between what's ideal and what's realistic. And so I can only speak from what's been happening in Quebec and sort of what we've understood from that. And I hope that some of that resonates with you. But in no way is it the truth or the way or, yeah, it's what you choose to take from it that I think is applicable. So without further ado, I wanted to talk about what we call in Quebec a social economy. Sometimes it's called a social solidarity economy, a solidarity economy. Um, really, I think the point for me, the key part of this is the notion of social economy. Social comes from society, right, a collective of individuals. And so a social economy is an economy that answers the needs of society, so the needs, the aspirations of society. The contrast would be an economic society, right? So an, a an society that follows the rules of the economy. So when people, for example, get laid off from their jobs, even though the company they're working for is still making profits, or when people lose all of their savings or their homes because of transactions between faceless corporations, that's society being impacted by the rules of an economic model. And what would it look like if we had an economy that was impacted by the needs and aspirations of our collective, of, of our society? And, and I think that notion of harnessing the economy for our society versus our society being impacted by economic change um, is really at the core of, of uh, what we're aspiring to. Um, why are we talking about the social economy? Because I think we've all um, understood that the model that we're under is unsustainable. Certainly environmentally it's unsustainable, but it's also unsustainable socially. And we can look at that from two ways, either that a few individuals have most of the th stuff, but also that together we're much bigger and much more powerful than the 1%. 
Um, the name, the social economy, exists and is used in most Latin-speaking countries. So, you know, France, Portugal, uh, most of Latin America, Quebec, because we speak French, it's not so much known here. There's a UN task force on the social and solidarity economy. Uh, and I think that reflects both that within communities, people are organizing. It's not a new way of doing things, right? People, communities have always come together to meet basic needs, to trade amongst themselves. Um, but I think it's all the more necessary in times of crisis. And at the macro level, governments are seeing that we have problems and what academics call wicked problems that are way too complex to have one expert within government or in a private consulting firm come in and give a solution and apply that across the board. Each community has its own sets of resources, of, of priorities, of things that they want to work on. And I think we're seeing a growing realization that these practices of, that emerge from communities that are owned and managed by communities in function of their resources are really important in addressing some of those problems because they touch on economic development, but also social cohesion, cultural vitality, et cetera. Um, so actually, you know, there are practices all over the world that try to do this, provide for food safety, uh, food, so, so, I, go, uh, I don't know the word in English, food safety, um, permanent and affordable housing, um, cultural expressions. I'm going to talk about one experience, which is in Quebec, which is a province in Canada, which is majority French-speaking um, and has its own sort of cultural and history around the social economy. So some, here are the, some of the numbers in Quebec of the social economy. So in Quebec, we don't have government statistics, but our, by our accounts, we're talking about a little bit over 7,000 enterprises providing two, over um, 212,000 jobs. That's not a lot maybe for the US, but we're not that many people in Quebec. What that means, it's actually one job in 20 is in the social economy. Most importantly, if you look at the size of this economy in comparison to major sectors of the economy, and I saw that uh, in St. Louis there's Boeing, in Quebec, we have Bombardier, which is a big deal for us, which is an aeronautic company. That's minor compared to the, the weight of the social economy. And of course, what these numbers don't account for is all of the other impact in terms of social cohesion, in terms of human dignity, uh, in terms of cultural vitality, in terms of community resiliency, um, which are much harder to measure, but are much more important in the long run. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how we got there. Um, as uh, Mo mentioned, I come from the Chantier de l'Economie Sociale, and really the core mission of the Chantier is to bring together sectoral networks, territorial networks, but also partners of the social economy. So other movements working for a more equitable uh, and more sustainable economy, and think collectively and strategically about what we can do to enable more of these enterprises and ultimately create a space, transform our economic model. Um, and so this work over 20 years has led to an ecosystem that supports the development of enterprises, um, but also reinforced the capacity of organizations and networks to not just think about access to housing or food sovereignty or local development, but to think that local development is one action in service of a broader economic transformation and that access to housing uh, is going to make a difference in the community and, and local services that are locally owned and where the benefits are redistributed will have a broader impact in the community and this is all what we want. Um, yeah, so what are some of the lessons that we, um, that we learned from this experience? The first one is I think the importance of mobilization. Um, that was really key in Quebec. The fact that we had a common terminology around the social economy, which is not saying that the term is better than solidarity economy or social solidarity economy or new economy coalition or community economic development, those are all valid terms. But agreeing, having one broad umbrella that everyone recognizes means that we can come together and work together. And it also means, um, which is my, we keep on going. Um, it also means that it was, uh, so coming together, being able to think creatively about what our common needs are and what tools either built by us or public policies um, will, or promotion will answer those needs has been really important. The second one um, is around transformation. 
I think that the, the, the purpose of this exercise was not to defend or to promote what, we, what was existing, but really to develop more and more in order to transform the economy. So the chantier doesn't work in favor of its members. The members around the chantier work together to develop tools that will not only serve their organizations and their enterprises, but will serve, will enable the creation of new organizations and enterprises. And ultimately the idea is that more, what, when and more and more of our economy is controlled collectively, and the, when the benefits are going down to the users and workers and producers, um, then we transform the economic model. And um, I think my, the third point that I would want to make is that this work is eminently political. Even though we're working in the economy and we're working with economic actors, Clearly, the idea is to shift the power dynamic. And in that, we need to be making alliances and talking with other actors who also have a vision of transformation. So social justice movements, the environmental movement, the labor movement are all potential allies. Um, and when we're working together to create a fund to support social economy enterprises, to create public policy, to enable governments to purchase preferentially from social economy enterprises, um, to create new innovative ways to reuse uh, collective infrastructure like abandoned warehouses and churches and things that the community has paid for in any case. Um, when we work together to find the tools and the ambition and the ideas to do that, um, we're reclaiming the control of our, of our resources and how they're going to be developed in the future. Um, so I wanted to maybe touch on one provocative idea because I think it's a uh, it's a really strong point that we have in Quebec, and it's not so widely accepted in the US, so I'm just going to go for it. Um, the idea being that the social economy or collective entrepreneurship, the way we define the social economy, it's co-ops and enterprising nonprofits. So they're managed collectively, uh, owned collectively, and the benefits go to members or the community. And that this is really uh, has more impact than individuals with good intentions. So individuals with good intentions is great. Um, social enterprises owned by individuals do really valid work to address a certain issue. Um, but I think there's three important limitations to that that we need to see. The first one is that if I have an enterprise that's serving a community, how accountable am I to that community about the services that I'm rendering? How do I know that that's really that if I'm giving them free shoes, it's really shoes that they want and not school books or whatever? Um, Second of all, so when the community has a seat at the table and it owns the initiative, then they have a, a, a word in saying what you can use or can't use or how you should shift the, the model. Should we increase profits in order to be able to expand for a while? Or should we reduce profits to increase accessibility? It's really important that the community has a seat around the table and, and, and owns the initiative. The second point is about um, profit redistribution. If my social enterprise goes really well, and hopefully it does if it has a good social mission, we're still perpetuating that a few individuals are reaping economic benefits and we're not enabling, we're not changing the economic power dynamic. So again, collective ownership means that the benefits from any economic activity are redistributed collectively and equitably. Um, and the third uh, limitation in terms of in individual initiatives is the um, perennity, is the, the lasting impact of that. Um, and I think we've all, we all know cases like, you know, Ben and Jerry's had this really great mission and then they sold to Unilever and that sort of, or, or the body shop, or, or just an individual who for a couple of years, you know, has a home crisis and needs to pay their mortgage and maybe doesn't have, doesn't distribute as much as they used to, uh, doesn't put aside 10% for their charity work or whatever. Um, again, the fact when an initiative is owned and managed collectively by the community that's benefiting from it, they're best able to say in times of crisis, yeah, maybe we will cut some of the profits or cut some of the, you know, raise the prices or however the arrangement is going to be, but they'll be the guardians of that mission. And so we both, we see in, in, um, in Quebec that collective, collective enterprises last longer than individually owned enterprises, but also the mission stays, they stay true to their mission forever because that's the, at the core of their creation. Um, and my other maybe contrast on the other side is the idea that the economy per se is a bad thing and we should just exit the economy. And so we can have uh, you know, a barter economy based on reciprocity and solidarity. And that's also a really nice idea. 
Um, but there's, there's a couple of problems with that, in my opinion. Obviously, we all do that in our community. You help out your neighbor who's just broken their leg and you bring them a casserole and you babysit your kids, you know, your friend's kids, and those kinds of reciprocity agreements happen in our normal representation of, of a cohesive society. But I think when it has an ambition to become a system, we, um, there's a couple of problems with that. First of all, if you take activities away from the economy, you take away taxation and therefore you limit the capacity of states to provide a basic social safety net to all people. Um, and that's really important. Regardless of how well governments work in each community, the role the government are supposed to do is provide basic services equally for everyone. And they can't do that if no one's paying taxes anymore because it's off the grid. Um, the second point is that you're, it's a great idealistic world, but it's sort of detached from the rest of the economy. So you're not changing private enterprises. You're not changing the, the ones who don't care could still be purchasing from you and using some of their resources to support the structural work that you're doing, or could be selling, or you could buy them over and make you know, worker co-ops or whatever and own those enterprises. So I think if we're really aiming to transform our economy, we need to get in there and engage with it and not build a, a a parallel utopia that'll serve a couple of very noble militant people, but won't transform the lives of everyone, whether they're engaged or not. Yeah, ultimately, I think what we should aspire to is a balanced economy. A balanced economy is one where the public sector, and this is an aspiration, I don't think this is the case anywhere, though I think we've seen extremes, certainly of a, of a totally public economy and a very nearly private economy. Um, but I think a balanced economy is one where the state has an interest, the interests of, of, treats everyone identically, and that's important. But we also need to account for the individual initiatives and collective well being. And some of those, some issues, cultural vitality, the management of local resources, um, they need to be managed, they need to be harnessed collectively. It can't be identical across the country, and it certainly can't be according to the market or profit uh, priorities of corporations. Um, I think, to, to conclude, uh, the, 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 um, it's clear that we're currently in an unbalanced economy, and that several issues are being looked at as, um, as issues that should be resolved by a private corporation that's going to think about maximizing their profits, rather than an issue that's a collective issue that should be resolved according to the priorities, the needs, and the resources of that community. And so, in conclusion, I would say that the, the important thing is to take back that power and to take back our economy, take back the levers of control, buy those companies, own those companies, work with those companies, transform those companies, and take back our economy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beatrice. <sighs> All right. Um, so like I said, I'm going to keep this moving. Um, but uh, I, I want to take a moment for a little self-care. So why don't we, do, I wanted to have everybody do some stretches. Do you ever like just sit and do some like shoulder rolls? It is kind of amazing the difference in your life when you like do like a neck roll. Do some shoulder rolls. I know for, at least for me, it makes me feel <laughs> a million times better. You don't realize like how hunchy you get when you're like sitting in a chair for so long. So, um, cool. So next up, we have Priya Johnson. Um, she's the political coordinator for the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. Um, and she's gonna be talking about what a feminist economy looks like. Um, so, uh, Priya joined the GGJ as, um, as political coordinator in January 2017. Um, after a range of international work, she spent a few years doing youth organizing um, for Youth United for Change in Philadelphia. And right now, she, hmm? yeah. and right now she's uh, currently rooted in her hometown of Atlanta. Um, so, everybody give it up for Priya. Hey, y'all. Can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. What's going on? 
Um, wow, it really is bright and hot up here. Um, it's a little sparse out there, and I was wondering if people would mind maybe moving a little closer. Um, I'm gonna feed off of your energy, so if people don't mind, if y'all are in the back, if you don't mind just moving a little closer, that would be great. Thank you. So while they're moving, I'll do the introductory bits. Um, like Mo said, my name is Priya Johnson, and I'm the political coordinator at Grassroots Global Justice. We are a national alliance of US grassroots organizing groups um, working to build power in frontline communities. We focus mainly on advancing grassroots feminism, climate justice, anti-militarism, and of course, building a people's economy. And to all of that, we bring a strong commitment to grassroots internationalism. Um, so building real solidarity across borders. In the past few years, we've been bringing our members and allies together through feminist organizing schools to discuss power and patriarchy, gender and sexuality, capitalism, feminism, and how to use all of that theoretical and historical understanding to build power toward a feminist future. For today, I'm gonna try and boil all of that down to five key ideas for y'all to take home. So, I've been asked to talk to you all about feminist economics, and we'll get there. But before we go any further, we gotta set a little bit of context. So Trump is president, and a global right wing is finding new ways to restrict the bodies and hearts of all of us, but in particular, women of color and LGBTQ people. Um, a pussy-grabbing misogynist and his followers are leading us toward austerity, expanding militarization inside and outside of our borders, and now even beyond into space, apparently. Um, they're ripping children away from their parents. Sexual assault has become expected background noise of a daily news cycle. Our bodies and our natural world are being commodified and exploited daily in the name of profit. I say all of this not to depress you, but just to give us a sobering reality check to say that we have to call out patriarchy, particularly given the urgency of the moment. And we're doing that, right? Yeah. Yes, maybe? <laughs> so make some noise if in the past two years you have um, lent your support or showed up to a women's march. Okay, all right. Make some noise if you identify as a feminist. All right, and lastly, this one's a little tricky. Make some noise if you identify as a grassroots feminist. All right, not too bad, not too bad. All right, so it's amazing. Feminism is here. Um, whether your feminist icons are Gloria Steinem or Audre Lorde, Beyonce or Cardi B, fe feminism is experiencing a much needed resurgence. Feminism was one of the most looked up words of 2017. But the first thing, oops, the first thing that I want us to um, remember is that feminism and the theory, feminism as a theory and ideology is as powerful as it is diverse. So it's shape-shifted and meant many different things to many different people in many different eras. In many cases, feminist leaders have actually emphasized gender oppression to the point of excluding the people whose voices and experiences should have actually been centered, right? So the voices and experiences of indigenous, black, and other women of color, and the voices of our LGBTQ family. So while I unfortunately don't have the time to go through all the twists and turns of feminist history, what I wanna make clear is our articulation as GGJ. So at GGJ, we talk about grassroots feminism. What do we mean when we say grassroots feminism? Grassroots feminism is led by women of color, LGBTQ, poor and working class people, all of whom understand that their oppression is rooted in patriarchy and its connections to capitalism, colonialism, white supremacy, transphobia, and homophobia. That the liberation of women is bound to the liberation of all oppressed peoples. Grassroots feminism emphasizes that patriarchy is a system that needs to be dismantled because just locking up perpetrators is not enough and doesn't address root causes. It insists on intersections and overlaps between systems of oppression because racism, capitalism, and patriarchy need one another to survive. It supports the grassroots leadership of women of color and LGBTQ people it pushes beyond representation because it's not enough to elect a woman to office or to push her up a corporate ladder. 
It celebrates and honors transgender and gender non-conforming people and rejects the construct of a gender binary. It builds solidarity with global resistance because nobody's free until all of us are free. So we really want to take advantage of this current moment and the momentum um, and excitement and reclaim feminism for the grassroots. So capitalism and patriarchy. Now, if you've given up your weekend to be here at Common Bound, chances are that you already believe that capitalism sucks. Is that a fair assessment? Yes? Okay. Or at least you believe that the economy that we live in is unjust. A few of you may believe that it's broken, that it's not meeting its full potential, and that in falling short is leaving behind um, low-income communities of color. Most of you, myself included, probably believe that American capitalism is not broken, that it's a well-oiled and fully functioning machine, a machine that doesn't just catch frontline communities in the crossfire incidentally, but instead sustains itself by systematically targeting and exploiting them. Capitalism actually needs patriarchy and racism to survive. It's how millions of jail cells get filled, toilets get cleaned, burgers get flipped, and one man can make millions of dollars off someone else's blood, sweat, and tears, right? The development of the US and its economy was based on the genocide of indigenous people, the theft of land, and the enslavement of Africans. Black people in particular were dehumanized and commodified in the interest of advancing and protecting the capital of white elites. This racialized economy built on a foundation of patriarchy, and particular the gender division of labor and property relationships of the feudal era, which I'll save for another day. <laughs> While we know that the connection between capitalism and patriarchy goes beyond disproportionate impact, the two systems are woven together, it's still important to recognize that today, capitalism harms women of color first and worst. Women are still paid only 79 cents to the dollar as compared to men. But for black women and Latina women, that's 60, 60 cents and 55 cents, respectively. Native American women have the highest poverty rate at 28%. 15% of transgender people make less than $10,000 a year. That's four times the poverty rate of non-trans people. But beyond these statistics, as the state withdraws from social services, it increases financial pressure on families and increases the amount of care work needed, often carried by women and by femmes. And then we have to remember that this beast of capitalism has no borders, right? So under neoliberal global capitalism, there's an international division of labor. After waves of anti-colonial revolution, industrialized nations needed to keep production costs low in order to fuel their never-ending appetite for growth. So they moved production. They moved production to the newly liberated places they were previously extracting raw materials from. And people in poverty in those places, and that, let's remember that poverty is a result of colonialism, people in poverty in those places were desperate. Um, to feed their families, they're forced to work under higher risk for lower wages. Capitalist elites in the West are able to fuel their growth on the exploitation largely of women in the global South. So this picture, the women in this picture work in a garment factory in Mauritius, an island in the Indian Ocean. They work for the equivalent of a dollar a day. I'm not sure if y'all can see the text on that shirt that they've, that they've made. Um, it says, this is what a feminist looks like. The shirt costs $70, which is absurd in and of itself, right? <laughs> but imagine these women would have to work two weeks to even afford the shirt that they're making. So it's a particularly gross commodification of feminism that really makes clear the sometimes insidious connections between capitalism and patriarchy. So, in order to build grassroots feminism, we must recognize the intersections and challenge racialized and gendered capitalism. This brings us to feminist economics. So feminist economics challenges the idea that feminism is limited to the personal, the interpersonal, and the social spheres. It looks at how patriarchy shapes the economic system that we live under. So I want to do a little experiment. If everyone could shut your eyes, if you're able and comfortable doing that. Now think of all of the work that you've been socialized to think of as women's work, women's responsibilities. 
Maybe you think of laundry, childcare, whatever comes to mind. Now think of all the women, femmes, gender non-conforming people, and even male identified people who carry that work. First in your own lives and then across the globe. Now think about all of that work done by all of those people over the course of a year. And imagine how much it would be worth in total. When you've settled on a dollar amount, open your eyes. So what do people think? Shout out a number. If you're in my session from this morning, don't give it away. <laughs> but if you weren't, shout out a number. Anyone? Just say it. What? OK. Any other guesses? Total, total value. Trillions, all right, all right, trillions. That's actually, that was a very good guess. <laughs> um, so I don't know how they calculated this number, but the UN actually put a number on it. They estimated that if women's unpaid work were properly valued, it would come to $16 trillion, increasing the officially estimated global output by 70%. So again, I don't know how they got that number. <laughs> Um, but what I can tell you is that it's a very large number and that it's an invisible number, right? It's, we, don't, we don't think about these numbers. We don't, we don't think about the labor as work. Um, but these are real people with real stories and real lives and oftentimes other jobs. So this is my mama. Isn't she pretty? <laughs> um, so, and these are my parents. They look super cool. Um, they moved to Canada and then the US from India in the early 70s. You'll notice the bell bottoms there. Um, they worked all types of jobs, right, to get on their feet and out of my aunt's house. Um, when they were just starting out, my dad worked the night shift as a security guard, and my mom did administrative work at a hospital. And they both worked super hard to put food on the table in what we would call productive labor, regular wage labor. But my mom, she came home and carried most of the rest of the labor, too, right? That labor that we don't usually think of as work. Um, as many moms do, she did the cleaning, the cooking, the chowdering, the community functions. And though it wasn't seen as work, my mama was carrying the reproductive labor. Reproductive labor is the mental, emotional, uh, and manual work that goes into maintaining people, maintaining people, family, and community on a daily basis. It's unpaid, as we're socialized to understand it as expected, particularly of women. When it is paid, think of home health aid workers or domestic workers, it's undervalued and undercompensated because alternatively, it's free. The irony is that without reproductive labor, the economy would sink. So most of you have probably seen some version of this iceberg before. This one was developed by Maria Mies. And what it shows is that at the tip of the iceberg, well, a small and visible portion of our economy is comprised of capital and wage labor. This is organized and regulated, but a much larger part of the economy is what is unseen, but actually keeping us afloat. The invisible economy is made up of informal work, subsistence work, housework, colonial relations, natural extraction, and more. It is unregulated, unprotected, and uncontracted. Most of this labor is considered as a free good, like nature. A lot of it is also considered illegal work, like street vending or, working, or farm working without proper authorization. But the labor supplied is vital. And until we begin to visibilize the entire economy, the whole iceberg, we'll continue sustaining capitalism on the backs of women and femmes, particularly of color and particularly across the global south. So most of us here um, believe in the urgency and possibility of economic alternatives. Is that right? Yes? Y'all don't sound very excited about economic alternatives. Can I hear that again? Yes? OK. <laughs> All right, so we may have different ideas on the way forward, but hopefully what I've shared so far will push you all to challenge yourselves, your organizations, your communities, to think about how grassroots feminism can and should be part of your, your vision for what a new economy looks like. So I wanna say again, um, I know that a number of people have already said this over the past few days, but feminist economics, just like the new economy movement, is not new. 
right? And hopefully that's not a surprise to all of you. And if it is, I encourage you to do some more digging. Um, talk to your elders, talk to your community members. You'll learn that many of our communities around the world have been practicing radical economic alternatives for generations, right? And in some cases, those alternatives have been feminist. Still, there's not an established doctrine or agreed upon principles of feminist economics. So I just wanna leave you with three simple ideas that we should bear in mind as we keep building our vision together. And I wanna give big shout outs to Maria Poblet from the Grassroots Policy Project for sharing these with me. So a feminist economy is one that, does this look like a feminist economy to y'all? No, right? <laughs> she doesn't live in a feminist economy. And uh, there, I'm gonna take questions later. Um, and so there's a, there's, there's a lot more images like that where this came from. Um, and I say that because a feminist economy is one that decommodifies our bodies. A commodity is something that has a price tag, objects that exist to be bought and sold, conquered and controlled for profit. Capitalism turns everything into commodities, from bottled water to yoga to our beaches and everything in between. We are not commodities. We can build an economy that supports our full political participation and our collective human development. And I know that this one, this piece can be tricky for some people because um, the issue of sex work comes to mind. And I just want to say that for myself, I think the real question when it comes to decommodifying the body is about autonomy, right? So if you're making a decision for yourself about your body, that's one thing. But when the system does it for you and uses your body in a way that's um, without your permission and without your power, that's a different question altogether. So is this a feminist economy? No, right? A feminist economy is one that exists in just relationship um, with nature. Treating nature as a commodity, a source of raw materials for capital, endangers the web of relationships that our survival depends on. Like our bodies, Mother Nature too should not be commodified. We can build an economy that supports human life and human development by recognizing our place as part of nature instead of trying to conquer and dominate it. And lastly, um, a feminist economy is one that socializes reproduction. So child care, education, health care, elder care, these are collective social needs, not individual family problems. We can build an economy that takes up our collective needs without exploiting people. So these are just three ideas that we like to uplift, and our members and allies are embracing and exploring them and expanding them. So just really quickly, one example, this is Miami Worker Center, um, based in Miami, obviously. Um, they bring a feminist economic lens to the struggle for fair wages for domestic workers, the majority of whom are women. Their work around the fem agenda emphasizes the importance of care work and reproductive labor and demands fair compensation. This is Mujeres Unidas y Activas in California. They bring a feminist economic lens to the fight for immigrant rights, including demands around a path to citizenship that recognizes the contributions of women's work and women workers and the need to keep families together. And these are our key takeaways. Um, I just want to end by saying people around the country and the world are using the concept of a feminist economy to organize, build power, and to cultivate a collective imagination of a feminist future. Um, and I can't wait to see what y'all come up with. A feminist economy is an economy for all of us. Um, and so I know if people have questions or want to talk about this more, please come find me after. Thanks. Give it up for Priya. I'm here, I'm here, I'm tiny. I know I'm tiny and it's hard to see me. Um, wow. Getting a lot of, of food for thought. It feels really good to have some time to just kind of like listen and dwell. Um, are you all ready? To, how, how are you all doing? Can I hear you? Or do you still have your energy? Do you still have your roar in you? <laughs> Maybe I'll make you get up and do it again. Um, all right, uh, so we're gonna switch it up now, all right? Um, I'm really excited, I'm so excited about this, this next piece. Um, we're going to see an, a few excerpts from Black Conference, uh, which is a 360 degree theater experience. 
It's set in 1939, so just close your eyes for a minute and, and get yourself in that, in that headspace. Um, and it's gonna be during the opening ceremonies of a civil rights conference. Um, packed with drama and political intrigue, Black Conference is gonna bring all y'all face to face with civil rights greats as they risk everything to build power and secure a place for Negroes in America. Um, so we have the deep, deep honor of having Reg Flowers, who conceived of this play, um, which was inspired by Jessica gordon Nemhard's book, Collective Courage. If it's not on your reading list, it should be. <clears throat> and uh, so he will, be, will come on the stage and perform a few excerpts from the work. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, they live in Detroit, um, a theater, uh, he's a, a, they're a theater of the oppressed practitioner um, and founder of Falcon Works Theater Company. Um, Reg has officially been a theater practitioner since, um, since the age of six. Can you imagine? The age of six. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so everyone, give it up for Reg. <laughs> I held a meeting at the Elks Lodge in Harlem, 90 degrees in the room, windows shut, curtains pulled, paranoid stool pigeons would carry word back to the bosses about who was there and the bosses would fire anybody they even thought supported the unions. They knew. We couldn't win anything without power. And we couldn't get power unless we organized. Been called the most dangerous Negro in America organizing labor. This plenary presents work over the past several years by everyday individuals, organizing neighbors, churches, co-workers, to build power and secure some place for the Negro. Helena Wilson is a lioness of the labor movement, organizing club women, Pullman maids, wives of Pullman porters, president of the colored women's, oh pardon, Mrs. Wilson, president of the International Ladies Auxiliary to the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, Helena Wilson. Ella Josephine Baker, agitated classmates at Shaw University, led mass protests to free the Scottsboro Nine, co-founder, eight years, director of the Young Negroes Cooperative League, and now directs education for Harlem's own cooperative, Ella Jo Baker. Our next panelist came to our Friends of Negro Freedom almost 20 years ago claiming socialist, the only group welcome a working class Negro wanted some intellectual stimulation, most uncomfortable man in the room. George came to write for us at The Messenger, fancy, started a column for the Pittsburgh Courier, then now is written for the Mercury, the Crisis, the Nation, and the Globe, co-founder of the Young Negroes Cooperative League, George Schuyler, ladies and gentlemen. And now, our keynote speaker. I can't list his accomplishments within the time allotted. Co-founder of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Organizer of countless conferences and gatherings on the state of the Negro race, the Atlanta conferences, the Pan-African conferences, and so many other convenings over 30 years, indubitably. Author of the seminal Souls of Black Folks, countless books, articles, papers, and plays. Chair of Sociology, Atlanta University. Comrades, Dr. William Edward Du Bois. So Black Conference is presented as a conference. The audience enters to find volunteers in registration and concessions and rehearsing their speeches. A 
Frantic, Bayard Rustin runs through the halls in search of a box of missing programs. It's the first sign of trouble because these programs contain the names of the presenters and in the wrong hands, this could be dangerous. A box of missing programs. A shortage, of a, volu a shortage of volunteers. A venue owner who gets cold feet, and so now the characters have to impro improvise to keep things going, and the actors have to improvise with the audience, asking questions, gossiping, filling them in on who's there and their significance and their existing conflicts, the trials that inspired them to become these agents of change. Characters, along with the ones previously listed, an openly gay Bayard Rustin in 1939, a virtually unheard of Gwendolyn Brooks, Richard Wright, Zora Neale Hurston, a 10-year-old Martin Luther King Jr. attending with his father, MLK Sr. The audience is engaged throughout. There's a plenary, there's a plenary that frames the event and fills us in, gives us some collective, uh, vo collective vocabulary and also some biographical Im information like the monologue I just did. The play invites existing cooperatives to give testimony during the performance, during a question and answer section. The play has its share of drama. Things heat up between the characters and oppressive forces reveal themselves in a final moment of the play that will be memorable, to say the least. The audience is drawn into this historic struggle and their urge to take up the reins and take collective action. Excuse me. I've just been informed this venue is no longer at our disposal. And the remaining training sessions will unfortunately have to be canceled. This should come as no surprise in the continued opposition from those in power antithetical to our aims. The truncation of schedule need and truncate ambition. We came here daring to dream a future. Well, I say it's time to stop dreaming. I insist we must wake up and recognize that future can only be ours by taking it and holding it. Stop telling ourselves someone else will do it and pawning it off on our children for heaven's sake. Talk is not enough. Hearing is not enough. There can be no satisfaction awakening to the truth while we witness and fall prey to dehumanization, exploitation, and violence. We can't be satisfied with citizens stranded in poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. We can never be satisfied with children deprived the fundamentals to become productive social contributors. And we cannot be satisfied when the choice must always be the lesser of evils. Every thinking, breathing human being has not a right, a responsibility to achieve and to evolve. You take what you've learned, you learn all you can and use it to arouse whom you might to act and organize and pledge our hearts, our minds, our bodies with no thought of reward. Our reward is in achieving a society of conviviality and cooperation. No force under the sun can block 
and stop a revolution of a people united. We have the tools, the know-how, and reason, our communities, our lovers, our children, our very lives. What we may lack is the will. We may lack the courage. We may lack the belief in ourselves being labeled for so long as unable, unintelligent, undesirable. But if these are the phantoms that defeat us, then we ourselves are the monsters. That, comrades, is the worst of nightmares. Finding content in hell and fear in heaven. Will you act? So the company of Black Conference. <laughs> yeah. The company of Black Conference has formed a touring cooperative of, yeah, of performing artists, engaging audiences through interactive performances that empower communities to take collective action. Yeah. The, group is, uh, the group is planning to tour several cities over the next 12 months, including the Worker Cooperative National Conference in Los Angeles. <laughs> Thank you. Dates in uh, Detroit, Michigan, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and the Pedagogy and Theater of the Oppressed Conference, the 2019 Pedagogy and Theater of the Oppressed Conference in Colorado, in Pueblo, Colorado. Um, we are constantly, we're uh, currently raising funds to subsidize travel to those places that might uh, best, m most benefit from the message of cooperative action to lift people out of poverty and to transform society. You can find us. Uh, oh, there's Jessica Gordon Emhart. <laughs> I just had to put that in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can find us at, uh, on Facebook at Black Conference Touring Company. Thank you. Whoa, my mind was kind of blown watching that. Yeah, yeah, you can be louder than that. That deserves way more than just a yeah. <laughs> wow, um, I'm very excited to see the rest of that. Um, so, uh, we are now at our fourth speaker. Two more to go. Um, and I wanna invite all of you to take a breath with me. So, if you're feeling comfy in this, close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Take a moment to imagine the world that we want to see. Um, imagine even what, what we were, were doing earlier today. Sitting in the sunshine, laying in the grass, breathing deep, talking with our comrades, and planning the new economy that we want to see, the cooperatives that we want to form, the, the power that we want to own. One more deep breath. Okay. Next, we're gonna hear from Amalia. Amalia Livingston is a member of Cooperation Jackson. Uh, she's gonna be talking about the Community Production Initiative a campaign to turn Jackson into an innovative hub of sustainable manufacturing and fabrication. Um, I personally love Amalia. She brings a beautiful, wonderful energy. So I want all of you to welcome her onto the stage with, with, a, with a deep energy and a big shout of welcome. All right, can we do that? All right, give it up for Amalia. <laughs> Oh, 
Ooh, all right, you guys. Hey, how y'all doing? Good afternoon. Um, as my comrade most stated, my name is Amalia Livingston. I'm a Jackson, Mississippi native, 22 years old. Um, and I am, I've been a long time member of Cooperation Jackson since like the, since the very beginning. Um, and I've believed in the vision and like just sustainable communities and um, building like a system of reparations for ourselves without having to ask permission for it, right? So, um, <laughs> thank you. So Cooperation Jackson um, and the Community Production Cooperative um, that I am a co-anchor of, I am a co-anchor of this initiative along with my, my homeboy, Jossie Williams, who is Kali Williams' little brother. Um, and we are helping to build a transition city. So this is me and my bio. Don't worry about that. I'll tell you more about myself myself. Um, so I'm 22. I am the second oldest of five children. Um, we're all Jackson, Mississippi natives, born and raised, straight out the mud. Um, and I graduated from Pearl High School, top of my class. Um, and the interesting way that I got involved with Cooperation Jackson full term is that I got a text message on my phone. I was working at Xerox in a call center. And Ia's text message um, popped up on my phone and she was like, yo, call me when you get a chance. And she left me a voicemail. That voicemail informed me that they had an opportunity for me to go to Detroit, Michigan for three and a half months. The winter of 2017, 2017-2016 um, and that was the groundbreaking of me having the courage enough to leave like the status quo corporate world and go into like this, this huge endeavor of like building my own and what that defines for me as like self-sustainability and doing what I love. Um, and, and, and in that, like that's how I got involved. I went up to Detroit, Michigan, um, and I was submersed in digital fabrication manufacturing, had never done it before. <laughs> Math was never my strong suit. <laughs> um, and manufacturing and engineering was never my, was never my calling until I, until I had this experience and Cooperation Jackson gave me that opportunity to do that. Um, so Insight Focus, Blair Evans is my mentor. Um, and I was allowed to go up to Detroit, Michigan, given the opportunity to go up there and learn about this awesome technology where 3D printing um, and electronics production, milling machines and, and like just you name it, is, is producing some awesome things. So just before we get too deep into everything, I just wanted to give you guys a couple key terms. Um, the first one is digital fabrication, which you've heard me say before, um, is a type of manufacturing process where the designs created and machines used are controlled by computer. Um, the means of production um, is defined for me as like the facilities and resources for producing goods um, and whatever medium that you use to do that with. Um, so it could be like claying or um, art mediumship or whatnot. Um, a medium of exchange is intermediary tool used to facilitate the trade of goods. Um, it must represent a standard of value and recognized by all parties involved. So the one mean of, medium of exchange that most of us may know about is like the, the dollar, right? Or the euro or whatnot. So just kind of shifting the narrative from the dollar and like US currency being a medium of exchange to like time and, and people and the energy and resources that we put in on a daily basis being that medium, right? So. These are some of the products that digital fabrication and manufacturing can produce. Um, so when we talk about digital fabrication, which is one of the terms that we spoke on um, on this slide, um, you basically use a, use a computer to communicate to machines a design process. So this laptop stand, um, which would like keep your legs from burning up, right? <laughs> if you sit the laptop on your lap. Um, this stand was produced by like a laser cutter machine when like you, you communicate the design on a CAD program, which is computer aided design on a CAD program and you send it to that laser cutter machine and it cuts the material out for you. Um, this is what you call subtractive design um, or subtractive manufacturing um, where the, you subtract the machine itself subtracts the, um, the materials that are not needed and leaves what you need, right? So that's one dope process. Um, this computer cart slash um, like plant housing 
nursery scenario. Uh, <laughs> yeah, y'all, this is Google. This isn't my project specifically. I had pictures, but they all got lost um, on my old phone. But this is one project that um, we had considered going ahead and going through with the design on. Um, and this is also like a, a subtractive manufacturing project um, that digital fabrication, like, it's literally just as, as far as your imagination can take you, that's like what you can produce, right? And all it is is really just having a solid understanding of what these machines and what the technology can do. And if you can communicate it to the computer and to the machine, you got it, right? So it's, it's some, pretty dope, some pretty dope things that are being produced. Um, with this machinery. So a lot of my pictures are missing, sorry y'all. Um, so this diagram here is kind of a breakdown of like where the CPC fits in the model of CJ. So our mission statement, Cooperation Jackson's mission statement, it was um, formulated from the Jackson Cush plan. The Jackson Cush plan has three pillars. But three of those pillars are, one of those pillars are economic solidarity or the solidarity economy, um, independent political politics, and people's assemblies. Um, that, in theory, is like the, the formula to create like a sustainable community and to empower people to like have the reparations and to kind of just give it to themselves and just empower people to, to have a voice um, and to have sustainable cities, solidarity cities, fabrication cities where they're producing their own goods, right? That's where the CPC fits in and to the big puzzle um, and human rights cities where like you stand up for what you believe in and you send policy, um, independent policy to like the big dogs and they make the decisions for you, right? And you hold those folks accountable. Um, and there was another slide on the other side. It might come up. It, it's not coming up. All right, so these are just a couple cool memes, but I'm gonna just kind of go into the breakdown. <laughs> go into the breakdown of like what the community production center means for me. Um, so when I think of like community production and like taking over the means of production, seizing the means of production, what that means for me, and especially in a ambitious project like the Jackson Cush Plan, is that especially when it's um, black and brown people that are taking this initiative to stand up for themselves and for what they believe in and get their own. Um, you have to pretty much be prepared to be put in exile to a certain extent, right? So when you have the means of production and the, and the ability produ to produce things yourself and on your own, for your own, um, that gives you like a certain level of autonomy. Um, and a, certain, and a level of autonomy that we need and we have to be taken into consideration about, right? So like this level of technology is very simple to learn. As I stated, I had never done this type of thing before in my life. <laughs> um, and I can pretty much crank out a lot of, a lot of things that like I can use around the house. Um, I've created like rings when I was up in Detroit, Michigan. Um, it was my first time ever being that far up north ever in my life. Um, and a lot of the stigma that was around Detroit was like very high crime and you have to watch out for yourself and you're female and you have to protect yourself, right? So a lot of the orientation that I had around Detroit was very stigmatizing um, and it, it wasn't very healthy for me personally. So one of the first projects that I did when I got to the Fab Lab um, Insight Focus in Detroit was that I produced a ring and that ring had four spikes on it that fit perfectly in between my fingers, and I ran a lot. I was doing cardio. Can't tell now, because I stopped. But I was doing it, okay? Don't, don't question me, all right? So I was doing cardio, and I did it where the ring fit perfectly between my fingers, and it was 3D printed, so the plastic is extremely hard. Um, and like I was able to fit it in between my fingers, so when I was running, it felt like it was just a regular old ring, but if anybody approached me that I didn't know, like I could do a real solid jab to the face. So it was like the equivalent, <laughs> it was the equivalent to, um, to I guess, uh, like brass knuckles, but it was plastic, right? So it, <laughs> it was pretty dope, and um, I hate I lost all my pictures, y'all, but I promise I can pull some up. If y'all wanna come and talk to me afterwards, I'll be more than happy to pull those pictures up for you. Um, I've created jewelry, um, 
things for my mom. I, I made her a jewelry box. So I mean, like, this technology is pretty dynamic in what it can do. Um, there are people producing micro and tiny houses, um, cement printing, 3D printing modules. Like, it's, this technology is off the chain. Um, and I'm just so happy that I have the opportunity to, like, be in a space where, like, I'm, I'm hearing people talk about these radical ideas and hearing people talk about, like, the ideas that they have for water purification systems and, and how to, like, keep people from getting sick and a lot of times like what I think about is how I can fit that into the model of um, community production and digital fabrication because it's so extensive that all you need to know how to do is like how to program the machine to do what you need it to do and it can execute it so like around water purification um, there are a couple people out that are doing projects around that and like how can we how can we make that on a macro scale so that everyone could have access to it right um, so those are conversations that we're in um, those are dialogues that we're in conversations around is like how can we even like have decentralized internet um, for people who don't have access to it like in rural areas that's one thing that's really big in Mississippi right now um, is a lot of rural areas do not have access to internet and like libraries are closing and that's a really big problem. So like we're trying to figure out how to decentralize that and um, let me think. So um, sustainable communities um, and reparations, of course, when, when you're talking about the Jackson Cush plan and in relation to the five contiguous states, South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Florida, um, and like how they are in relation to like the Mississippi River Jackson in particular. Um, there are a lot of different aspects as to like why the Jackson Cush plan was, was created and designed to be in that specific area of the South. Um, one of those reasons is because like black folks already had an understanding of like self-determination and self-defense um, and to like keep, keep their families safe. That's one thing that you are, when you're doing a radical project such as this ambitious project like the Jackson Kush Plan, um, you have to have people who already kind of have that orientation, right? So that's one of the reasons why Jackson specifically was, was chosen for this project and for this initiative, right? So I'm just, I'm privileged to be in this space. Thank you all so much for listening. Once again, um, this is my first time ever, ever doing something this big. So thank you all, thank you all, thank you all. I feel so much love, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, but yeah, y'all please hit me up. I'm a ball of nerves right now. I promise I got so much more to talk about. So hit me up afterwards. I'll be more than happy to chop it up with you. Okay, cool. up on that. Take her up on that, y'all. <clears throat> Amalia will be here tom through tomorrow, so make sure to, there, there's so much going on in Jackson right now. It is, it is just blowing my mind and the minds of everyone who knows about it, so, um, so yeah. So I encourage you to come, uh, come in and converge on, the, on our speakers after, after we're done here and, uh, and just ask them more questions. Um, our time is almost at an end. We're at the last speaker. Um, I'm sad. I could watch this forever. I love like seeing kind of like these like little peeks into into what's going on. Um, but I'm I'm incredibly excited to bring it on home with our last speaker, uh, Tashara Jones. Uh, she's the treasurer of the city of St. Louis. Um, and uh, she's here to talk about municipal child savings programs. Um, it's the, one of the recommended solutions in the Ferguson Commission report. Um, Tashar is the first woman to serve as treasurer in the history of St. Louis. Give that a shout. <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but I always feel a lot better when there is a woman in charge of the finances. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, during her time in office, she's saved the city millions of dollars uh, through streamlining treasury operations and increasing transparency in city government and modern, modernizing the parking division and opening the city's first office of financial empowerment. That is an office that I want to exist in every city in our country. Um, and um, like I said, bring it on home because Tashar was 
um, an adjunct faculty member right here at Harris Stowe State University. So she's been on the stage before and I'm excited to welcome her back again. So put to get her hands together one more time for Tashara. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good. So we're gonna have a conversation. I'm gonna let you into my life a little bit. I want you to know a few things about me. I'm a, I'm a daddy's girl, after being a mama's girl for 29 years. I never wanted to be a politician. I'm unapologetically black, and sometimes I'm petty. <laughs> And I'm the mother of the most adorable 10-year-old son. Check out his adventures at hashtag Stuff Aiden Says. <laughs> Growing up, I didn't know we weren't rich. I didn't know we weren't poor either. Uh, my mother and her sisters and brothers did all of this magic around me and my cousins, and we never knew what was going on. We just, they just did what they had to do um, and hid it from us. Like most people, I learned my financial habits from my parents. My mother took me to the bank with her every two weeks to cash her or to put her and my dad's paychecks in the bank. And my father taught me the importance of saving and investing. And both taught me the value of retail therapy and how it's okay to splurge on something nice for yourself every once in a while. Things got better when I went to high school. My father got a better job. We moved into a better house. And then I got accepted to Hampton University. And I did, but you know, when, when I got accepted, we were definitely on a payment plan and college was much more affordable in the 90s than it is today. I did a brief calculation of how much it would cost and how long I would have to save and how much I would have to save each month in order to send my son to Hampton at today's prices. And I would have to save $1,000 a month for the next eight years just for today's tuition for four years. We're not even talking room and board, that's crazy. After a brief career in the legislature, I was convinced to run for treasurer. Now, those of you who aren't from St. Louis, the treasurer is the most unique elected official in the country, no, the world. Not only am I the city's chief cash management and investment officer, I'm the city's parking supervisor. So I'm in charge of parking meters, parking enforcement officers, parking tickets, all under my authority. But I decided to use my power for good and not evil. <laughs> when I ran for treasurer, I looked around the country to see what other treasurers did. Simple, right? You would think everybody does that. And that led me to Jose Cisneros and Stephanie Neely, who are the treasurers of San Francisco and Chicago. Well, Stephanie's not the treasurer of Chicago anymore, but she was at the time I was running. And both of them let me kind of call and pick their brains about what they did, but I found that they were using their power as the city's chief banking officer to convince banks to spend their CRA dollars in low-income communities, to convince banks to um, put together products that didn't penalize people for using them, and then also decreasing the number of unbanked and underbanked families. And as I looked at my own life and the lessons that I didn't learn about financial literacy, because shortly after I graduated from college, my father got sent to jail for income tax evasion. I had to move back in with my mother. I started a business that failed, and then my mother got diagnosed with terminally, terminal cancer, and she shortly thereafter died. And I was left with one choice, to file bankruptcy. And it took me 10 years to get back on my feet financially. And it was hard, but I survived. But as I looked at my own life and the lessons I didn't learn, and as I was running for treasurer, I said, this is gonna be the clarion call of the treasurer's office. We're going to help people who either, either prevent them from making the same mistakes I did or if they had experienced those kind of financial hardships, put them on a path back to financial stability. So after I was elected, we started the city's first office of financial empowerment. And our mission is simple, to help people make better choices with their money. 
And I told you about using my power for good and not evil, right? So every time you pay a parking ticket, every time you feed a meter in the city of St. Louis, a portion of that goes to fund these programs. Most importantly, the College Kids Children Savings Account Program, which since 2015 has opened over 10,000 savings accounts for uh, every kindergartner entering a public school in the city of St. Louis, and we load it with the first $50. No, this isn't $50. It's a $20 bill with my picture on it nonetheless. So this is one of the match savings programs through our partner, First Financial Federal Credit Union. On family savings nights, every family that enters a credit union gets a $20 Tashara buck, as we call them, and we match it with another $20. So there's a way for, for kids to save, who, or families to save who don't have money. So what is a CSA? Comes in many names and many forms, child savings account, college savings account, child development account. It's simply a, an account open in the child's name to save for post-secondary education. And some of you may say, well, $50, that ain't shit. You know, that college is expensive. You're right, college is expensive and no, $50 isn't a lot of money. But studies say it's the presence of the account, not what's in the account that makes the difference. And studies also say that children with less than $500 saved are three times more likely to go to college and four times more likely to complete college than children without savings. Some of you may also ask, what prompted you to do this? A few things. Number one, I was following the lead of one of my mentors, Jose Cisneros. His kindergarten to college program is now is in, is in its seventh year. Also, as a black woman in politics, I lead from a different place. I try to solve problems and advocate for policies that help black mothers or single mothers like myself. Because I firmly believe that when you solve for black women or women of color, you solve everybody's problems. And third, because we're in St. Louis, the death of Mike Brown also prompted me to start this program. In May of 2014, I started meeting with leaders, local leaders, to uh, investigate starting our children's savings program. Five months later, Mike Brown was murdered and Ferguson burned. And in the months after, the Ferguson Commission released its report and one of its core recommendations was the establishment of children's savings accounts. This made my mission that much more urgent because CSAs give children hope where hope doesn't exist. So what does hope look like? Well, before we talk about hope, let's talk a little bit about justice. You see, justice isn't about the police not murdering Mike Brown and leaving his body in the street for five hours. Justice requires us to ask ourselves the question, what would Mike Brown's life be like if he was still alive today? There's an 18 year gap in life expectancy in St. Louis between affluent zip codes next to poor majority black zip codes. We see violence on TV every day, but what we don't see are the people hard at work to address the root causes of violence, poverty, low wages, air pollution, poor transportation, and a lack of hope that kills people in our community every day. So hope looks like, aren't they cute? This is Deneen and Sean. Sean has been in the program since kindergarten. And Deneen, his mom, who didn't go to college, sees this program as the promise that Sean will go to college one day. And Deneen said, I wish that there was a program like this that invested in me and cast a vision for my life as a young child. I wonder what my life would be different like if, that, if this program existed when I was a kid. Hope also looks like Lucian. He's my favorite. Lucian's parents have been talking about him, talking to college about him since he was two years old. So it doesn't seem overwhelming. And Lucian's parents see this program as the jumpstart that their family needed to start saving for his education. 
And Lucien has some advice of his own to kids that are currently in the program about how to save and build their accounts. So Lucien participates in medical research studies at the hospital, and he also saves his money from his chores. Hope also looks like families that stop me in the street or stop me when I'm grocery shopping or at the restaurant to say thank you for taking this off my really long to-do list. Hope is also embedded in Aesop's fable of the tortoise and the hare. Remember that story? So at the start of the race, the hare just takes off running. He's running and he looks behind and the tortoise is going at a slow and steady pace. And so the hare decides, you know what, I'm gonna take a nap because I got all the time in the world. He's not gonna catch me. I can take a nap and wake up and still win the race. But the tortoise keeps going at a slow and steady pace. Then the hare wakes up to other animals cheering the tortoise on because the tortoise is almost at the finish line. So he gets up and he races towards the finish line, but he's too late. The tortoise wins the race, fair and square. And what's the moral of the story? Slow and steady sometimes beats fast and flashy. Think of the tortoise as CSAs, long-term investment built up over time, it also teaches lessons along the way of financial literacy and financial stability and responsibility, and you don't have to pay it back. You think of the hair, student loans, quick financial need, long-term financial hardship. Also, there, the U.S. currently has $1.3 trillion outstanding in student loans. I know I have some too. And student loans often prevent home ownership in younger generations. Some may also think of the hair as scholarships. Families think they have all the time in the world and they get to the last couple of years of high school and then realize, oh, I didn't save or prepare along the way and scholarships are competitive, they're not guaranteed and they leave families with very few options. So what's the lesson here? Slow and steady wins the race. CSAs are long-term investments. It's a long game. It's a big picture investment, things that you often don't hear from government. Because oftentimes, we lose patience with government. We lose patience with each other. We lose patience with the process and the system because we want our trash picked up now. We want that pothole fixed right now. We want that parking ticket fixed now, right? But slow and steady wins the race. We need to change our thinking to be more like the tortoise. Big picture investments over time, or small investments over time, lead to big returns over time. If we can be patient with our investments in the stock market and our investments in our retirement funds, then we can be patient with our most important and valuable asset, our children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tashar. Actually, stay right there. Stay right there. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Um, I'm going to invite all the rest of the speakers onto the stage. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Come on back up. Yeah, start clapping. Keep clapping. <laughs> Do you feel inspired? Do you feel energized? by these beautiful people that have come here uh, to share their wisdom and share their lives. Um, I just wanted to bring you all on stage because you're, you're all so beautiful. <laughs> and I just want to like bask in the glow of all your, your beautifulness. I'm just gonna run around. <laughs> Keep clapping, let's clap. <laughs> um, yeah, we just want to, we, um, you know, it takes a lot to come here, um, you know, and, it, and it's, uh, I know that, Tashar, you're from here, but it takes uh, a lot to come here and to take the time and share the wisdom um, and share the life. So I just wanted to take a moment to just say thank you to all of you so much for being a part of Common Bound. Uh, thank you all for being here to, uh, to listen, I know you're all like waiting to cut, cut more. Um, Thank you all for being attentive listeners. Um, are you all ready to party? Yeah, okay. So let's give one more round of applause for all of our speakers and let's party!